and the ghost of Christmas way future. I've already met the ghost of Christmas future. I said way future, Scrooge! Like presidential scandals, dance fads, and unfortunate entries into the 27 Club, each generation has its own era of the Muppets. For me, it was the 90s renaissance of their arm-waving burlesque that wrapped my heart in day-glow textiles and inclusive wackiness. They introduced me to classic literature, unpredictable drummers, the peerless work of the talking heads, and most profoundly, the work of Charles Dickens, with their 1992 Yuletide classic, The Muppet Christmas Carol. The first major production by the Jim Henson Company since the death of their titular founder in 1990, there's an unmistakable tenderness to these holiday hijinks. It's a heartfelt hug of a film, one that asks us to consider the inherent worth of all life, to right the wrongs of our past, and offering a better future through personal growth and redemption. Thank you. Of some 150 plus adaptions of this nearly two century old tome, I'd humbly argue that this one isn't just the most entertaining and approachable. For my money, it's also the best. Cheers. God bless us, everyone. You don't need me to recap the story for you. The Muppet Christmas Carol charts the journey of Ebenezer Scrooge from a tight-fisted curmudgeon to a philanthropic saint after he's shown the error of his ways by a trio of timely ghosts. The most notable thing about this take on the material is, of course, the ensemble cast of whimsical Muppets. Yet, any notion that their presence will somehow diminish the material with childish tomfoolery couldn't be further from the truth. My taxes go to pay for the prisons and the poor houses. The homeless must go there. But some would rather die. If they'd rather die, then they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh dear, oh dear. Don't get me wrong, this doesn't turn its back on a good gag. The best of which come from Rizzo the Rat, who, as we're wryly informed by the opening credits, is playing himself. What the web, not the rat! My apologies! Put me out, put me out, put me out, put me out! Rizzo! What? What I'm saying is, the levity isn't at odds with these cobbled streets and moral awakenings. As Dickens himself writes in the book, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humour. It is a tradition for me to make a little speech. And it's a tradition for us to take a little nap! <laughs> the Muppet's absurdity adds an accessible entryway for younger audiences to experience this cold, often cruel tale of salvation, with the safety net of knowing that Fozzy probably isn't going to get his throat cut in the third act. Accessibility isn't the same thing as dumbing down, and this is a radiant example of how to maintain the integrity of a text, whilst adapting it to suit a different demographic. See also the teen movie makeover of Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet. If you actually cross-reference the words of Gonzo, Kermit, and Kane, with their counterparts Charles Dickens, Bob Cratchit, and Ebenezer Scrooge, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one translation from page to screen. In fact, the inclusion of Gonzo and Rizzo as a Greek chorus by which to communicate Dickens' expository narration is an ingenious stroke of economy and invention that almost no iteration of A Christmas Carol has learned from since. He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Then there's the symbolic importance of the Muppets when applied to their role in the story. From Scrooge's perspective, here amplified with a Henson lens, almost everyone out with his immediate family is viewed as inhuman or less than. He towers over this comparatively minuscule ensemble, 
and is able to send them scurrying with just an expressive barb. Will you stop that? <gasps> Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. To Scrooge, these are but toiling animals, rats and frogs, who aren't worthy of emotional rapport or conscientious consideration. Here, the proletariat are the downtrodden puppets of the bourgeois, marionettes of a system weighed in monetary gain rather than ethics. I mean, you can yell and scream and you're right, but it won't do no good because I'm the stone you can't squeeze blood from, and that's the truth! Now, I'm not a pretentious enough jerk to imply that this reading was in any way the intention of the filmmakers. They're Muppets because this is a Muppet movie. However, their implementation does lend itself to a thought-provoking texture that goes beyond felt and fabric. I'm being absolutely serious when I say that Steve Whitmire's Kermit is a better Bob Cratchit than any of the human attempts to embody and encapsulate his optimistic resolve in the face of crushing poverty. Tis the season to be jolly and joyous. The same goes for Tiny Tim, rendered with such adorable glassy-eyed innocence that the weight of his existence is only amplified by his diminutive froglet frame. None of which would work if it weren't from Michael Caine playing it completely straight as Scrooge. Why do you delight in torturing me? Potentially one of the best performances of his enviable career, Caine said when he first stepped into the role, I'm going to play this movie like I'm working with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And it's with that gravitas and aplomb that he sells every unblinking Muppet and anthropomorphic object. It's a feat of acting that emphasises not only the ferocious spirit of this crooked old man, but the looming fear that pulses through him each time the bell tolls. That's because, for all the screwball silliness filling out the margins, The Muppet Christmas Carol is effectively Gothic Horror 101. Our introduction to Scrooge isn't with a Tim Curry swagger or Miss Piggy's confident strut. Low-angled shots emphasise his monstrous visage, while the frame's canted lean offers an insight into the twisted way in which he views the world. Humbug. Naturalistic lighting and muted palettes offset the rainbow coalition of characters hopping around the poverty-stricken streets of London. Once the sun begins to set on Christmas Eve, visions of warping door knockers and threatening apparitions drive home that, while we're not exactly in Hammer Horror territory, you can certainly see it from here. As with Kane's commitment to playing the part of Scrooge with the seriousness it requires, director Brian Henson never shies away from the morbid essence of A Christmas Carol. This is a cautionary tale in which a miserly wretch is psychologically tortured until he snaps, disassociates, and starts over as a new man. <laughs> Marley and Marley may crack wise and knock it out of the park with one of the catchier musical numbers of the film, but then they are dragged to hell, all rattling chains and writhing moans. It's kind of horrible. The three ghosts that follow to set Scrooge on his path of righteousness are also quietly terrifying. The ghost of Christmas past is a disquieting, uncanny apparition of a childhood lost, drifting ethereally through the opacity of life and death. Leave me. The ghost of Christmas present stomps around with their burly, boisterous exterior that shrinks and decays as the harsh reality of Scrooge's mortal coil begins to unfurl. Finally, the ghost of Christmas yet to come appears as an ambiguous shroud of grey, complete with a cavernous absence where their face should be. A cross between a black hole and death personified, they offer nothing in the way of comfort or consolation. I fear you more than any spectre I have yet met. Oh, this is too scary. I don't think I want to see any more. 
By utilising the blend of puppetry and marionettes to craft these otherworldly figures, they're more memorable and haunting than most other takes on this story, many of which default to person in a dusty costume, speaking in a spooky voice. When discussing the Muppets' first foray into the nightmarish underbelly of fiction, Hanson opined, you need to go to those dark places for the ending to be as joyous as it can be. And he's absolutely right. This isn't just a flirtation with the shadows. Henson and company are trusting children's emotional intelligence rather than coddling them, so that in the end, when the desaturated streets begin to bloom with all the joyful colours of Christmas, it means that much more now that we've toiled through the alternative. A feel-good ending propped up by the catharsis of horror. <laughs> the Muppet Christmas Carol earns pride of place not only as one of the definitive cinematic outings for this iconic cast, but as the ultimate take on Dickens' seminal wintry wonder. The contrast it finds between the dusk and dawn of one man's voyage of self-discovery how it defies expectations whilst honouring its parentage, how it uses its central gimmick to elevate and expand on the thematic undercurrent of a text it so clearly loves. I loved it as a child, I adore it as an adult, and as someone who writes about the impact and importance of cinema from one week to the next, I truly cherish everything it stands for. Whether or not you celebrate this season, Regardless of denomination or how much stock you place in holiday cheer, The Muppet Christmas Carol is a shining star in the December sky. A warm embrace for our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire MD, Becky O and Nicholas Le Revere, and a hot cup of cocoa for all these amazing folks who support us over on Patreon. So what are your memories of The Muppet Christmas Carol? Sound off in the comments and let us know your favourite Muppet movie and your favourite version of A Christmas Carol. The best way you can help this channel is to like, comment, subscribe and share these videos with whoever and wherever you can. If you're in a position to do so, consider checking out our Patreon at the link in the description below where you can get access to our private Discord, the Inframe Out Film Club and get your name in the end credits of each episode. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is Inframe Out. Out.